talk us through how you first became aware of Nureyev. Kind of how did you discover him, and what about him stuck out to you? I think the first time I was aware of him at all was when I was aware of adult talking about one of the great ballet dancers. I have a distant memory of saying I'd never seen a ballet, and would I? And I think I did see a Swan Lake years ago. And people saying, if you want to understand ballet at its greatest, you should have seen Nureyev dance. Um, but I didn't come to the project because of an interest in ballet. I came because I read the... I was sent the first six chapters of a biography of Nureyev by Julie Cavan about 20 years ago, and those six chapters are what you've seen. They're mm. the story of his childhood, his student years in Leningrad, and his weeks in Paris culminating in his defection. And it just completely moved me. I mean, the defection itself leapt off the page as something thrilling and cinematic in itself. But also the journey of this young boy with this ferocious sense of vocation and a fierce will to realize himself as a ballet dancer. And coming from a background very, very poor with very uh, I can't help but think a very, very unsophistic unsophisticated education. I mean, this was Soviet Russia in 19, I mean, after the Second World War, when uh, it, it, in an area of uh, a time of great, great, great poverty and lack. And just one of four children, three sisters, and he's the only boy, with just go, takes his first, I think, traditional dance lessons at the equivalent of primary school and just finds this thing that he has to do. And his mother supports him. His father is reluctant, but he keeps going. And his hunger to absorb all art forms as food for the thing he wants to do, that just really moved me. And I cut to 20 years later, I have directed two films, and this comes at me like the thing that I want to attempt to do next. And when you were developing a project and when you decided this was your third, going to be your third film, did you kind of why did you decide to make it about those early years up until the defection instead of kind of trying to grasp the uh, entirety uh, of his amazing life? Uh, because frankly, I think this is the most interesting bit of the life as a film. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I mean, another, another director might disagree and want to make a film about his years mm -hmm. with Margot Fontaine or do a general biopic or do his later years or cover his time at the back. I just didn't, that didn't speak to me as the story I wanted. Mm -hmm. This is the story for me. And I, so that was it. Just there's, a, you know, you have to respond. What's the story you want to tell? Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel any obligation at all to address the rest of his life. It was also a kind of parable about the artist or the performance artist. It's, of course, it's about Nureyev, but it's, I hope it's applicable to any young person with a, with a huge desire to... It's about self-realization. Mm -hmm. And um, David, just to move on to you, did you feel any, when, when you came on board the project, did you feel any kind of pressure of writing his story, considering that he's so well-known, so well-documented? and No, so I just expected? thought that nobody really knows the story. It's one of those things where the myth is so powerful and almost everything about the myth is wrong. So, you know, when I was young, everything was about the leap to freedom. Mm -hmm. And it was capitalist propaganda that uh, he chose the West over the East and that it was some kind of political choice. Nothing could be more untrue. It was a choice about dance. He had no, uh, f he did not foresee during the time that he was in Paris that when he went to the airport, he would be disciplined to the degree that he would have to go back to Soviet Union and not be allowed to dance with first class companies. And so he had this extraordinary moment, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. in which he had to decide, do I go back to the Soviet Union, where the chances are that I will never again be allowed to dance with a first-class company, or do, will I, do I go to the West, where I will never be happy, I will never go home, I will never see my mother, I will never see my beloved family, I will never see the people that I came from, but... I will be able both to dance and to dance outside the Russian tradition. Much as he adored the classical tradition, he mm. wanted to be a modern dancer. Mm -hmm. He'd already read about Eric Braun, who later became his lover and his partner and the person who introduced him to contemporary dance, so that he was faced with, do I follow the art or do I follow my life? And at that moment, he decided to follow the art but it was not a leap to freedom in the terms that capitalist propaganda later presented it. Oh, he preferred the Soviet Union. Sorry, he preferred 
Western life to the Soviet Union. And I also wanted to show that Soviet Union life at that time was not, again, the cliché. It was actually the time after Stalin, where people who lived in the Soviet Union were beginning to feel, oh, things are getting better now. Under Khrushchev, the crimes are being admitted to, people are no longer being sent to the gulag, there is no longer this terrible weight that was created by the Second World War and by the oppression of Stalin. We're beginning to move into the 20th century and to feel free. And so the story is just nonsense in its, in its familiar telling. And the way of telling it in a new way is what really excited and interested me. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit, because obviously he's the main character, but I find some of the supporting characters so rich and mm. they tell us so much about him mm. and the formation of his personality as well. But actually, for both of you, can you talk a little bit about the ones that you find are the most meaningful in, in building of the character of New York as well? Well, I think once we discussed it, we quickly could find as part of the, the true story and um, put the, Alexander Pushkin was one of the great ballet mm -hmm. teachers immediately presented himself as an interesting character to both of us he was an unusual teacher I believe because he didn't have a dictatorial teaching style he sort of taught but with a sort of a oblique method whereby mm -hmm. young dancers were encouraged to l discover their own mistakes and correct them themselves. Um, and certain that, that marriage is very interesting. Ksenia Pushkin and Alexander Pushkin nurtured young dancers and would have them into their little apartment and, mm -hmm. and feed them and give them tea. Uh, also, I um, mean, the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Um, also, I think we both were interested in how would we portray uh, Vitaly Strushevsky, who is the minder, so they would be the KGB affiliate officer with the mm -hmm. Kirov. I think we both felt we would like to avoid the cinematic cliches of the th sort of quote-unquote thuggish or aggressive or overly intimidating mm -hmm. uh, KGB officer. We came to feel this was to show a highly intelligent man who is actually possibly likes Rudy, thinks Rudy is interesting, but he has a certain job to do and, 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 and as sort of the group behavior has to be adhered to. So, I mean, David, there were other characters too, maybe that you... Yeah, well, obviously, you know, there was this extraordinary situation. This teacher um, who Rafe plays in Russian, you know, like any film star, he can speak Russian. Uh, <laughs> And so he plays in Russian uh, Pushkin, who was, first of all, the teacher of Nureyev. And one of the ironies, which I can't deal with in the film, is that he was in total despair after uh, Nureyev defected because his most brilliant pupil had defected and he was ashamed. And he also felt, I will never find another great uh, dancer as great again. Two years later, Misha Baryshnikov walked into <laughs> his, uh, and he also taught Baryshnikov. And Baryshnikov helped us, and we spoke to him a lot, because obviously he's somebody who knew Nureyev very well. He has some of Nureyev's possessions. He kept them when Nureyev died. He, he obviously was the great counterpoint to Nureyev in, in life, the, you know, the two great dancers who were different and interestingly different, but equally great. And um, Baryshnikov you know, spoke of Pushkin as this extraordinary teacher. Mm. But there's no doubt that uh, Nureyev was meanwhile conducting an affair with Pushkin, the, the, the wife of the person whom he admired most in the world. And the three of them were living in a room together uh, in, in, in the way we represent. He was lying on the floor and they were lying in, the two of them were in bed together. And so I'm not saying that, of course, that was part of the factor that at, at Le Bourget, when uh, with no notice, you're suddenly presented w with 45 minutes to consider which way are you going to go. But on the other hand, there were reasons why Nureyev, who had realized by then that he was primarily homosexual, uh, there were reasons why he did not wish to return to that ménage à trois, which was stifling him in the view of his male lover, um, Thea, who was... Thea, who, the German boy, who's, who, who was his first serious affair, the two of them. 
Um, thank you. And Oleg, just to move on to you, um, this is your first screen role ever. Um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, kind of what your initial reaction or feelings were when you got the news that you had the part. Um, and just to translate as well, I understand that this is your first role on the screen. What was your first reaction when you told me that it's your first role? По-английски. Ну, у меня упала так челюсть отвисла. Я смотрел долго в окно. И пытался поднять свою челюсть. Uh, ну, ощущения были невероятные на самом деле, потому что я, по, я как, как только получил приглашение, я пообещал себе, что если ничего не получится, я не буду расстраиваться, но я сделаю все возможное, что я могу по максимуму, выжму из себя. Uh, but uh, the emotion, the feeling was amazing. Uh, so when I got this invitation to uh, play the role, I uh, just uh, uh, told myself that I'll do uh, everything I can. I'll uh, do my best, and uh, uh, I'm not going to be upset if it doesn't work out. But I'll do my best. And um, has your perception or your opinion of of Rudy changed since you've given life to him on screen? Um, ваш имидж или ваше мнение о Руди изменилось после того, как вы его играли? Оно поменялось, мне кажется, в лучшую сторону, потому что раньше для меня он был просто ублюдком. А сейчас он для меня очень классный ублюдок. Um, and Rave, could you talk us a little bit about your process in directing Oleg in his first role as well, and also uh, once again, kind of directing yourself as well as both an actor? Well, yes. Yeah, first of all, I mean, we we did, we we. I, I was very cl clear to myself that I wanted to find a dancer mm -hmm. who could act. And David's the first time I read David's screenplay was clearly a great acting role. Um, and we did a huge sweep of, uh, uh, looking for this young boy through calling young male dancers from the principal Russian-speaking ballet schools and um, ballet academies. And Oleg was on our radar quite quickly. And finally, after about a six-month search, we had about four candidates. And we did a screen test in St. Petersburg. And then when I got home, I looked at the tests. And it was very clear to me very quickly that Oleg had something in himself Uh, uh, he was able to access and understand the ideas and the directions that I gave him during the screen test. Mm -hmm. And it w I just felt that as I watched him, there were things happening where I felt, this is it, this seems close to the Rudolf Nureyev that I've watched in lots of documentaries. And his fate, I, mean, I spent a lot of time looking at the real R R Rudolf Nureyev. And uh, so then wanted to meet him again and I um, wanted to, Oleg to understand the sort of concept of ha inhabiting an interior life, which I believe is important for a screen actor, that you, this, this and this are active. You're not necessarily showing, you're inhabiting and being, and that thoughts and emotions reveal themselves in, in, the, in the face and, of course, principally in the eyes. And the shifts of thoughts and feelings, if you are having them for real, they will be seen, because the camera in film, the camera comes to the, to the actor um, and he seemed to understand this principle alarmingly quickly <laughs> and um, I think it was um, I, I mean to be honest we followed a hunch I mean I every time I worked with him I felt I was seeing real potential evolve but I, there was an, a wonderful day his first day of filming um, which is the film outside the Louvre. It was raining that day, and he munches on a croissant and asks the cleaning lady what time the museum will open. And as soon as we rolled on him, it, was, it fell into place. He was not fearful, not anxious, not self-conscious. And suddenly I got, I got incredibly moved and excited, and I could see the sort of lights go on in the eyes of the producers and everyone around. And he continued just to be incredibly natural and responsive and it's been wonderful to watch him evolve in in the part and of course he um then yeah, it was great and then regarding your mm. question about myself well it's very hard to direct yourself 
I think, and not feel that your head is in a vice um, because you've got to take care of all the other mm -hmm. elements of, of camera and lighting and, and nurturing other actors. And then I didn't want to be in the film, but then I, I was confronted with a sort of financial reality that um, it would help the film that, it, that there might be someone who was known at, you know, at a bit of a profile internationally. <laughs> so that's where my Voldemort credentials came in useful. <laughs> Uh, and so I folded. Um, I, I don't speak fluent Russian. I do have a little bit, um, but I had to work very hard to get to speak to the level that I, I, I do in the film. But I, I, it was a one, I knew the screenplay very well, mm -hmm. so I knew the text, and I had studied that. As the translations came in, I had worked on the translations or tried to understand what was going on, because there are necessary shifts in translation. You don't. They, the Russian spoken is not a literal translation of the, the subtitles Indeed. you read. <laughs> he doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the li there are a lot of lines about ordering sausages, as I understand, <laughs> in Russian, but I have no way of knowing what the actors are saying. Um, before I open it up to the audience, I just wanted to ask all of you, actually, a question about... You've mentioned a couple of times um, the need to tell the truth about Rudy and to portray kind of these authentic and complex man who was first and foremost an artist. Um, and also the depth of the supporting characters as well and the amount of life that they give to him and mm -hmm. to the reality of the Soviet Union at that time, which, like you mentioned, is not all, you know, super bleak. But I just wanted to each one of you, if you could talk about those particular elements that you really wanted to stress in the film, be it the particular character or the use of the Russian language as well in it, which I found really refreshing, actually, um, that it was in film with a bunch of international actors speaking with Russian accent. Mm. Um, what one particular thing would you stress was the thing that you really wanted to make authentic? Well, I, if I may quickly say, that you're right, you picked up mm -hmm. on that. There were, well, the, the, Ru the importance of the, the real languages, mm -hmm. so Russian spoken where Russians would have been speaking Russian and French where French would have been spoken. Thankfully, we, under we knew that Rudy spoke English, had taken English lessons and spoke mm -hmm. English in Paris. But the point about the Soviet Union was that a scene that's very important to me that mm -hmm. I can't probably explain why it's important, it's just that when the young Rudy goes to the apartment where the young students are around the table mm -hmm. and it's a sort of Russian Sunday meal yeah. where everyone talks and they drink and ideas are exchanged mm -hmm. and I've been invited to lunches like this mm -hmm. in Russia and in fact those two twins, brother and sister twins, their real selves are the older couple at the end of the table who you catch a glimpse of and they are the real friends of, were the, the real friends of Rudolf Nureyev, they're alive and living in St. Petersburg, Leonid and Luba and they were very hospitable to, to, to myself and to David and to Gabby many times, in fact. And, uh, and, it w and I just had this very, what was really important was mm -hmm. to show that life. And they described these gatherings around mm -hmm. the table. Um, and um, just to quickly say, we, had, we shot most of the film in Belgrade. We shot mm -hmm. key exteriors in St. Petersburg and Paris. But we recreated that St. Petersburg apartment in Belgrade. And um, I was insistent that every single actor around that table came from St. Petersburg. Because <laughs> some day producers would have said, you must use local Serbian mm -hmm. actors who are wonderful. But I wanted to have, so you talk about authenticity, mm -hmm. that was a scene where I felt mm -hmm. I must try to be. And Lyuba and Leonid came and they, Lyuba inspected the apartment and <laughs> corrected everything and made sure that it was, it was felt right. <laughs> I'd, I'd just like to say that my least favorite words in world cinema are based on a true story. And <laughs> I just, when I see that prophylactic stuck over every film that I see, I just go, that means they're about to mess around with the truth and not tell it, you know? And this, we really are trying to tell the truth. We, as I best understand it, this is exactly what happened to Nureyev. This is the story. Occasionally, and we took one license, which was to move the moment at which Pierre Lecotte did indeed go to a, a class. He did indeed say to Nureyev, you will take Paris tomorrow, but the one thing you must do is fight fear. He did say that. But Rafe insisted that he say this on the top of the Paris opera. Um, looking out over the whole of Paris. Now, he did not do that, but by one of those extraordinary coincidences, which is so deeply moving to any filmmaker, 
I was then told that when Nureyev himself became the head of the Paris Opera and he took Sylvie Guillem, and Sylvie Guillem was at that time just a dancer in the chorus, and he said to her, you move straight up to Etoile and I'm going to make you the leading, act, the leading dancer, her immediate reaction was to walk up to the roof of the Paris Opera and stand to deal with the fact that she'd just been made a star. And so when I have occasionally taken a little bit of license, it's a, it is the kind of license that I think is absolutely true to the, the, to the story we're telling. But they're such minor licenses, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Um, oh my God, I forgot my own question. Какой деталь, если есть один деталь, который вы можете вспомнить о Руде, вы хотели как бы восстановить, то есть какую-то деталь реальности о нем, которую вы хотели привести в вашу вашу роль? Ну, самое главное, мы хотели показать именно нашего Нуриева, нашего молодого Нуриева, mm -hmm. как он переживал за это все. Uh, well, the most important thing we wanted to uh, depict is uh, our Nuriyev, our young Nuriyev, and uh, how uh, um, uh, he uh, felt about all this. Как написал Дэвид Хэ, то есть об этом всем, то есть мы пытались это полностью перенести и создать нашего молодого Нуриева. Um, how um, David Hare um, uh, wrote him uh, how to translate it into uh, film and uh, recreate our young Нуриев. Мы, мы очень много работали с Рейфом, чтобы mm -hmm. показать именно того Нуриева, которого, ну, который. Вот, как мы думаем, он так поступил и так думает. And we worked a lot with Rayf to show Nureyev as we think he would have behaved and felt. Вот эта жажда, жажда познать все новое, вот это вот показать свой дар. This kind of thirst for anything new, this desire, burning desire to display, show his talent. Быть быть жадным ко всему, вот познать все и быстрее. Uh, to be voracious about everything, to uh, uh, know everything as, as soon as possible. This is an incredibly hard film to finance. Uh, we um, were in, we, we thought we were getting uh, some private equity investment out of Russia. That went away just as we were starting our, our key location scouts and we had to reconsider our whole finance structure. Our producer Gabby is not here to talk about this further. It was extremely difficult, and we um, we had a very difficult time in prep. We, we thought we had a, a shortfall of finance which we would make up in our pre-production, and, and that didn't happen. Um, at the last minute, it happened through private equity investment, but, the, but Hanway Films came in with a minimum guarantee. BBC had some money to put in. There were some, some um, private equity investors. Um, including myself, um, but the money was not was hard. It was very, very, very hard. Nothing. There was no magic wand. There was no. Uh, the first tranche of money got us through first bit weeks of pre-production, but um, it was a painful experience of anxiety. It was not something I'd care to repeat. Sergei plays a great Soviet dancer, Yuri Salafiov. Um, he clearly is possibly the greatest male dancer around. Um, I made a choice that Oleg was the right person to play, dramatically play in Nureyev. Oleg is a very fine dancer, but I, I approached Sergei because I thought our film would be enriched by his presence. And uh, he was a gentleman to work with. He was incredibly supportive of me. He had a very difficult dance ballet performance schedule. He came overnight in buses from Munich, where he had been dancing, to be on time for our set in, in Belgrade in the morning. Um, and when we were shooting some of our ballet sequences, he was there as a colleague and a supporter of Oleg advising him. So I only have the greatest respect and admiration for Sergei and his participation in this film. I think there's huge potential on the ground in terms of how, I mean, I'm, from a personal point of view, working in Russia and with the production company we work with in St. Petersburg and the friendships that I've made, uh, principally on another film that I've made in Russia and over the years, of course. I mean, I think we're at the mercy of, 
um, administrations and how they lock horns. And clearly there are things to us about the current Russian administration that are troubling. For instance, um, Kirill Serebrenikov, a theater director, film director, and now um, permanently, it seems, under house arrest. He's able to work from home, um, but no, uh, no, no charges against him have been proven. So that might be indicative of some element, said certainly in the cultural field, that is troubling. Um, but if you focus always on the things that are wrong, you lose sight of the possible connections. So I, I believe that cultural interaction um, whether it be a Russian exhibition that comes here or an English theatre company that goes to Russia, these things can keep the, the paths open. Because I think there's huge potential for our countries to, to work together and to in, interact together. Um, and it's just these... There are, there are things that are disturbing, but I think if we get bogged down in focusing on those, we lose the present tense possibility of really keeping the, the cultural interaction alive. Mm. <laughs> Хоро вопрос. It's a good question. <laughs> Но мы очень, <laughs> мы очень много работали на самом деле, то есть потому что это больш, ну, ты берешь на себя большую ответственность. Well, in fact, we've worked so 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 much. You uh, basically take a lot of responsibility on yourself. Во-первых, ты должен не подвести команду, которая в тебя поверила. Uh, it involved uh, also this uh, feeling of not letting the uh, team uh, down, those people who believed in you. And uh, also another responsibility is not to uh, disappoint uh, uh, Rudolf Nureyev, who is up above. Я много читал, много смотрел, настраивался, старался мыслить, как он. То есть старался перевоплощаться полностью в него. Um, lot, I I, uh, И в определенный момент я почувствовал, что, вы знаете, как будто он так зевнул, проснулся и дал мне немножко свободы. Gave me a bit of freedom here. No, what такой вот ублюдок. That's uh, that's the kind of bastard he was. 